Hi, everybody. My name is Ryan. I will be your MC, but I will also say as little as possible so that all the real experts in the room can answer all of these really great questions. Um, thanks for coming to our very first Chats on Colfax. Uh, we are planning to do these as regular events and change both the time and the day of the week, as well as the subject matter, to suit whatever small businesses on the corridor particularly need. So today is kind of an overview of both of the project and then also we're isolating different aspects that we've heard from businesses that they wanted to hear about already since we're still two months ahead of construction. Uh, two, did I do the math right? Three. Um, if you haven't yet, also like at some point before you leave, we'd really appreciate it if you would uh, just sign your name, just let us know who was here and what your business was. Oh, welcome, welcome. And this is supposed to be very casual, so um, please feel free do not feel like this is a classroom and you have to sit the whole time. The bathrooms are right here. Um, and then there's lots of food and drinks, so please help yourself as well. Um, we are, I'm gonna introduce everybody who's gonna have a speaking role today um, and, a, and a little bit of procedural. Procedurals are small. I do wanna just let everybody know that we are recording. And because we're recording, uh, one of the things that will really help with the flow of that is if, um, although there will be time for questions, probably between each segment, we encourage you to keep them to the end because then we can just cut off that section from the recording to keep all of your questions and your information that you share private. Um, but we do want to use these as resources for people who couldn't make it because they're running businesses. Um, and so everyone that we do, if there isn't proprietary information involved, we'll make sure we put on our website. And that website is going to be referenced several times here, and then we have um, information where you can access it if you, if you, have, it, if you have it yet. Um, on that back table, we've got printed copies of several business resources we've put together, um, general fact sheets, but also um, information. We've got toolkits, and that's on the website, but I just printed out some people like the textual feel. Um, and also, if you think about it and you have strong feelings about anything, we have two surveys. One is for future chats, so if there are things that you'd like us to share or information that you need from us, please fill that out. We're trying to make sure that we have programming for these events as they continue to go down the corridor. And then the second one is an evaluation of this event. So um, there's lots of food. So if you get to the end and there's plenty of yes, the answer is yes. Um, and then also I just want to introduce my colleague who's really helped me set up this event. This is Dominic, and I just couldn't do this without you. Thank you so much for all your help with this, especially the lugging part. It was a hot day. <laughs> Bringing all this equipment down here was, uh, was not that super fun. Okay, so I'm going to go around the room and introduce um, some of our speakers, and then I'll kind of MC and let you know where, what, what our next sections are. Um, so uh, this is John Stewart. He's our project hey, director for the East Colfax BRT. Um, we have Marcy Loughran, back there, Construction Communications Manager. Heather Bedini is our Construction Communications Coordinator. Danan Moore is our Business Support Director for Colfax Ave Business Improvement District, what we affectionately refer to as the bid. Then there's, next to her, is Chris Bishop, the Small Business Specialist with UMB Bank. Um, back here, we have Joanne Greek, the Small Business Program Manager at Denver Economic Development and Opportunity, DO me, Ryan, and I come back in at the end. So I'm going to turn it over to John and then Marcy for the first segment, unless there's any questions so far. Cool. All right. Well, that sounds good. Oh, this is this is the agenda. The, yeah, we did the, has we did the intros. The project <laughs> partners, they're important. <laughs> Ta-da! This is the PowerPoint, everybody. <laughs> Okay, John? Yeah. Okay, so uh, we are in the final stretch before we go to construction for this project. Uh, we did recently find out that uh, we requested $150 million from FTA. Uh, we got notified this week, this, this is hot off the press, that we did get that full $150 million from them. And so really what that means is now we're just doing the home stretch of filling out all the forms to get that uh, to get that funding put into a City of Denver bank account so that we can spend it. 
and we're working on going to execute a contract, a construction contract with our contractor. And we expect to be starting construction this fall. Uh, we're very optimistic about October happening for a construction start. I can't tell you the exact day yet because we got to get all our thumbs up from FTA and sometimes there's delays in there because people take vacations and things like that. So we're looking at October and we're going to be starting uh, we're going to be starting on the west segment and moving our way east and the first intersection where that will really be starting is at Pennsylvania. And then uh, the next stop after that, I think, is Downing. Uh, and so the, the construction is going to be centered around these first few stations. Um, and we'll be gradually moving our way east, like I said. So this kind of gives the rough outline of the different segments that we're going to have. And so the segment one is this Broadway to Williams segment. Uh, you can see it's on the left. Uh, if you look along the uh, al along the top of the screen there. So there is a stop at Broadway, but those are on the sides of the street. And we're not going to be doing that at the, at the very beginning because we need to get the stations constructed in the center of the roadway first. Um, where's Mar Marcy? Do you want to kind of talk through what the phasing looks like? Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So you'll see, you probably see, I've been in front of this, um, scrap it a few times, I know it's going to be at the, um, the meeting. So the circles here represent um, the stations. And if you go actually back one slide, like John said, we have um, segments to construction, um, and they're all broken up along here. And then you can also see how some of these segments overlap. So we're not just doing one segment, segment one, um, phases one, two, three, segment one, and then moving on to segment two. So there's definitely an overlap, and that's just sort of the sequence of construction. So we could be in phases, you know, one, two, partial of three, and moving over to phase one and here and overlap. And it really helps with that, the flow of construction and any efficiencies that we can find to just keep us moving down the corridor. <coughs> so that's why you see this. And then you can see also this is a very general um, time frame. But now that we've got such good news <laughs> from the FTA funding, we can really kind of dive in to the details of kind of the chunks of time that we're going to be at any one of these. Areas. So those are things that we're going to look into in a lot more detail over the next um, few months as we work to get um, the construction contract going and the start date um, identified, and then we can really dive into what does what does the schedule look like? I know everybody wants to know when we're going to be kind of right in front of um, of their business, and we'll get to understand that really soon. And um, and part of our outreach is to make sure you know that before we show up at your at your uh, front door. Uh, so the next slide. And we really anticipated kind of three phases to, to construction. So we'll start on uh, one side of the street and, and put the barricades in place and move everything down to uh, two lanes, um, one lane in each direction on one side of the street so that we can continue this kind of forward motion along that, that corridor. We'll also have dedicated um, bus pullouts. We'll re, um, I can show you some of this next slide too, but we're, uh, that we might relocate some of the stops based on where construction is happening um, and make sure we have some dedicated pullouts there. But we want to get um, kind of phase one is getting one side of the street done um, in relatively order of the, of the phases, and then you know kind of flop, flip flop, go to the other side, and start doing that station construction here. This is really this these um, visuals are really showing the station construction. There's a lot more construction that is going on with um, soil cells and tree cells and, and um, just some other sidewalk improvements and other roadway improvements that happen. But these are really where you're going to see a lot of the the kind of vertical construction, so to speak, where you see a lot of things happening. When things are in the ground, people wonder, like, why are you not, what's going on? Things aren't really happening with construction, and it's things that are underground, it's, it's a lot harder to see when you um, start getting to utilities and things like that. And then we come over to that final phase, which is, okay, we've got these stations um, constructed, undergrounds um, typically done, come in and do kind of those station commissionings and, and any kind of final station touches. So I think this is where, like, lighting, um, maybe the signage packages, um, ticket booths, and um, kind of any of the, the bedazzling that needs to happen to the station, and then any kind of final work that needs to happen in any of the, of the other areas, like the, the trees and the soil cells and things like that. John, you want to add anything to any of that? Yeah, could you go back? Yeah, sure. um, so as far as what this fall might look like, 
it'll look like phase one and what it'll be is a, centered around Pennsylvania, Downing, and Franklin. And so, and those closures will be about three blocks. They'll be less than three blocks, but it'll be basically a block on either side of those intersections. And, and so it'll just, those, that's where the first closures will be. Uh, I just wanted to explain that. No, I think that's yeah. really, and then, one oh, thing. sorry. No. Um, and these are, these are also just rendering, so I don't want people to be confused. Like, there might not be using Jersey barricades um, for, for all of these things. So you may see kind of the barrel cones, uh, things like that. But you can see where we do need to back up um, a fair amount um, with some of the construction um, separation, uh, basically, you know, so we can get people turning around and not turning into any of the construction vehicles or any kind of open areas um, in the street. So then on the next slide. So then, Construction mobilization. So when we get started, uh, hopefully later this, or what, not hopefully when, later this this fall, this is what you're going to see happening, the early construction activities. So site investigations, you'll also uh, you'll hear this called potholing a lot. So you'll see where you know, you've got a company to come in and just punch a, punch a hole in the in the asphalt and, and see what's under there. We look for you know utilities, unfor any kind of unforeseen conditions so we can see what we're dealing with when we go to actually uh, remove some of that, the, the street so we see what's under there. And so those are really good investigations because when you're in the middle and the throw of things and you pop up, you know, you break into the uh, to the ground and you find something you don't expect, that can cause some delays. And so some of this early site work investigation will help us continue our construction um, more efficiently. You also start to see us put up the signage and barriers and all the wayfinding. Uh, so the, the barricades that I just showed you, you'll start seeing those put, be put in place. Um, we'll do the new lane configuration, so we'll reduce it to one lane in each direction, which um, these are some of the visuals that we're putting together for flyers and such that will be handed out to, to you all as business owners and residents around the areas. And we're going to, you can see this is just a chunk of them. This is a very long roadway, so it's very difficult to show on an eight and a half by 11. So we're gonna really chunk out some pieces here. So you can see this is from Broadway to what we have here, um, to Pearl where you have the, the one lane in each direction and then the red identifies where kind of those construction zones and construction areas are. Here we're also going to mark down where these temp stations are and your stations are and what the blue shows here is kind of what those pullouts will be. But getting the new lane configurations organized, getting the lanes moving in one direction, which is great before we start doing any heavy work, if we can start to get the patterns and the consistency with folks going down the roadway and getting kind of used to that one lane and what do these turns look like, things get um, very normal. People, you know, it really takes about two weeks for behavior changes with cars is what, um, on average. So if we can get those people, um, everybody going in the right direction, I think that really helps. We'll also be um, moving the, um, the stoplights and all the signals to match what these new lane configurations are. We've been on some other projects where they just sort of use either the temp ones or you have to look at the ones over on the side. I know there's one like in our area, Heather, where it gets a little bit confusing. So again, just creating some, some normalcy to what this new pattern is going to be um, as we move forward. And then we always will probably list on things, our construction protocols, the things that we will always maintain, which is where you will always maintain your access to business throughout construction. Um, we'll always have one lane of traffic in each direction. And then we also, for our um, deliveries and any construction stuff, we have defined delivery routes. So the, our, our truck drivers and deliveries, they know where to come in, drop the stuff, and where to get out so that we don't have them winding through neighborhoods or, or parking in front of your business when they're not supposed to. So we really get that um, organized right off the right off the bat, and those will be things that we discuss with all of our, our drivers um, on deliveries, um, probably on a, on a daily basis. And then the RTD will maintain the 15 and 15 mile service as well um, with some of these temporary stops. Uh, we'll work to make sure we have connections on the website to connect to any of the RTD resources, and then we'll, RTD is a partner on this project as well, so be working um, a lot to give that it, give them that information, but they'll be posting it on any you know their your app your ride apps, putting information inside the buses, um, you know even QR codes of where you need to go, just so that everybody's aware of any of these um, changes to their, their bus uh, routes. Are really really bus stop the route stays the same. Any cool? I think that was my last slide. Yeah, and you know what? Yeah. We're already had a schedule. Oh, yeah. okay. So no questions. I mean, we can we could take. Uh, couple minutes so if someone has an immediate question I can talk fast sometimes I'm sorry no, that's <laughs> great what's the implementation for uh, parking meters on the streets the perpendicular streets when does that fit into the parking meters 
So parking meters are going to be added to oh, a lot of the perpendicular streets yes. to Colfax. Like, does that does that sort of happen just as the construction is going, or does that happen like at the end after the route is in place? Or that is that a fit into it? excellent question, John. Do you know when we add in meters? Is that something that comes in later, uh, or is that during yeah, our stuff? Yeah. That that's going to be happening for years down the road. Um, get it all done and then yeah, yeah. Okay. That's a great question, um, and we'll just mark that so that we make sure that. <coughs> Others? Another question? Okay. Definitely more information to come. Not a ton of new uh, information to share right now, but we'll keep it coming to us. And each finish. of the different phases, will there be some form of construction in that phase on one side of the road or another throughout that whole phase? It really will depend on the segment that we're in, okay. but hopefully, yeah, the, the, the thought is to you know, like continue the stations in on say the east side at one time and then flop over to the other so that you don't have the construction on this other side. So um, it should all be maintained on the size that we're at. Um, but we'll be some some streets are a little bit different with the soil cells and things like that, but um, it should be pretty consistent is what you'll see. And when Marcy talked about soil cells, that's just plate we're adding in a bunch yeah. of trees in the area. So that's that's what that's talking that's true. about. Yes, yeah. true. I should just say trees. They, they go. Oh, Putting okay. trees in. I'm just to dig them in, that's a little more complicated. <laughs> the water. And oh, will that be part of the later construction plan and, and mapping out of where we're going to try to put trees? Or yes, so sort of the next phase of messaging that we're going to be putting out, the, the graph that you just saw here is that mobilization. And then we're working on how to go down next level. So you'll see what your what your segment impacts are, what side of the street you're driving on, and then have um, probably two pages. We just can't figure out how to get this all onto onto one. But page two will be then what kind of uh, tree work um, and any kind of sidewalk or curb and gutter work is going to be happening in any specific area. So we'll have that all in one if, uh, notice and, and such for you. Okay. And so then we'll be able to send those out. And then if you have questions and such about anything that we send out or it's, you know, it's confusing or like, what does this mean for me? That's just when you, like, you know, it's going to be on the bottom of all those flyers um, so that we can kind of have that dialogue and, and talk through it all. Thank you. You're welcome. Any questions? Yeah. Is work to be more narrow than sidewalks? I don't think the sidewalks are going to be more narrow, are they, John? No. No. If, if we'll either maintain the sidewalks in our current width, there are a few places where we're actually making them wider. Perfect. Okay, and uh, just if there's more, uh, we'll just okay. have plenty of time at the end. Yeah. Okay, thank Absolutely. you. Um, Thanks. So we're going to move into specific business resources that we've started accumulating. And um, I just want to draw attention uh, quickly to these these two pieces that we think are very useful. Maybe you've already had this information, maybe you've already done, but um, Joanne, would you like to chat about this sure. a little bit and then um, talk about grants, that's the next thing. Sure, I know, everybody wants to hear about grants. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Joanne Greek, I'm with Denver Economic Development and Opportunity, known as DDO. It's an agency of the city and county of Denver, and we've been very fortunate to um, have a number of some dollars that are dedicated to these resources, but also the project team um, with CIG, right, with, um, we will be uh, getting a number of business uh, supports provided. So the first tool that we have is what we call our self-assessment. It's completely voluntary. You can go online and take it. You can use it on your phone as an app, or you can use it um, to just take it online. It just helps you think through what are my busy times of the day? When do my when do my deliveries come? Um, what do I want to tell my employees when they answer the phone? Do I want them to complain and say, oh, the construction's terrible, don't come down here? You need to have a script for your employees that says, you know, stay positive, tell our tell our uh, customers that we're open for business. Maybe today it'd be a little crazy, come in the back way, we have a back door, make sure you come in that. So self-assessment to just help you think through Am I ready for construction? The Small Business Toolkit is very similar to that, although it has some actual tips and tools that you might want to think about. So before construction starts, this is a good time to start collecting information about your customers. Collect their emails, um, collect their phone numbers, and then maybe you want to use a text, a bulk text messaging app to just stay in touch with your customers, remind them that they're open. 
Um, let them know when you have specials uh, so that they uh, you can stay in touch with them. There's also things about maybe you want to, if you have a line of credit with your bank, maybe it's a good time to sit down with your lender and say, hey, I want to make sure my line of credit is in good shape in case I need to draw on it. So that toolkit will give you some tips on how to prepare for construction and how to deal with construction when it occurs. Next slide. The grants that we have for businesses are very similar to what we did for I-70. Does anybody remember the I-70 project about that started back in 2018? We did grants for businesses along that corridor. And we're, going, we're doing it for the 16th Street Mall. You probably know the 16th Street Mall is undergoing major uh, reconstruction. So we have a similar program here for the East Colfax businesses. Um, eligibility, because the program is intended to help small businesses, um, the eligibility is restricted to businesses that earn between $30,000 and $5 million in the previous tax year. You must be registered with the Secretary of State. Um, to be qualified for a grant, you must compare 90 days of pre-construction revenue with 90 days of during construction revenue. So for example, if in this first segment, construction starts in October or quarter four of 2024, by the time you get to quarter one of 2025, you might look at your books and say, wow, I really did lose some money as a result of the construction. Some businesses do, some businesses don't. It depends upon the nature of the business. If yours is a very destination-oriented business, your customers may still find you. If you're a walk-up type of businesses, it's a little bit harder. So if you do experience revenue impact, you want to take a look at your finances, compare pre-construction, you know, uh, when construction was happening perhaps, when there was no construction, I'm sorry, in quarter one or quarter four of 2023, and you would compare that with quarter four of 2024, the 90-day period. And then we have a number of, you know, uh, program priorities. We really want to make our sure our smallest, most vulnerable businesses rise to the top, and we can assist them with the grant. The grants are based on the annual gross revenue that the business earns. Businesses earning less than $100,000 may be qualified for a $7,500 grant. Businesses earning greater than $100,000 would be qualified for a $15,000 grant. And it is a one-time grant. Uh, based on the, the funding availability that we have. So in addition to those three resources that we mentioned there, I don't know if the next slide talks about the financial forums, or if, if not, I can elaborate. No, and I also plan to talk a little bit about some of it. Okay, so, yeah. yeah. And then we also will have info sessions where if we have an open round, there'll be rounds, you'll be invited to apply probably in early 2025, because that's after businesses will have experienced that quarter four of revenue impact. So early 2025, you'll be invited to apply. And um, we even have information sessions that we do uh, in person or we do them by Zoom so that we can help uh, teach businesses how to complete the application, how to do that revenue comparison. And and all of that too is, so we're, this is your one-stop shop for all of this information, is there's a small business support page on the Colfax BRT site and in that has all of this information but also I just want to draw attention to um, a couple of the things we printed out here one of them is just a set of links but there are things on there such as like we're partnering with Mile High United Way and through them an organization called Easy Tax Academy who will for free do your taxes help you put them in line and with it comes a free subscription to QuickBooks for a year so there's just little pieces like that that you can access through the website um, and then these two for example the self-assessment the small business tool they're all there and then in addition um, this this wonderful um, conversation about grants we have videos of um, what Joanne was referring to uh, in brief was uh, something we've done uh, a financial forum about resiliency so those video tools and, and as I mentioned at the beginning we'll also have all of these chats recorded and put up there just like just like the way the city would do for any public meeting um, so the goal is that as as you're asking questions too about 
we're trying to link to other types of grants that the city or whoever else offers, like this easy uh, tax academy. But also, for example, we just work, we just talked to the licensing team in the city who offer who offer reimbursements if, for example, you have to do a legal hearing um, to get a licensure. Uh, they will they have grants available to offset all of those legal costs that you might incur. And so we're just trying to make sure that this, if there are types of things that you might be interested in finding out more information about and what else might serve you or your fellow folks along the corridor, let us know. Um, just send us an email and, and we'll make sure we get those resources to you or, or, or at it. Um, so yeah, so that is, that is this section. Um, are there questions for Joanne? We're, we're again, we're a couple of minutes ahead of schedule, so um, let, let everyone know that I run a tight ship. <laughs> yeah, Frank. Uh, yeah. No earlier than 2025 when it becomes open, so that when construction starts later this year, you'll have some level of impact that gives you the ability to assess what that impact is. Then you apply <clears throat> based upon that impact. That imp Just a little footnote, that impact might not be the biggest impact that you'll mm -hmm. encounter mm -hmm. over the course of 18 months of construction. Question. And then when you apply, so all of the, I'm, I know I'm good at kind of repeating a lot of what you said, but um, when you apply then, how quick would, if you get a grant, would you be awarded it? And how, and maybe this ends up being question two for Chris or Danan, is how do you think of, how, how do you f forecast what impacts might be kind of in the future? And even if you could forecast that, does that will that mm. even play into your how you apply for the grant? It has to be an actual revenue loss. It can't be what I think I'm going to lose. Because you're going to compare, for example, you would apply in early 2025 and say, yeah, Q4 2024, I compared that with Q4 of 2023, I'm definitely down 25%. And you don't have to have your accountant put together a fancy profit and loss statement or an income statement. You can use Square, Toast. If you run a restaurant or a cafe, you may use Toast. Um, I have had businesses give me a screenshot off of their phone from their Square report. Uh, we can use sales reports, point of sale reports that come off your registers. So that it does have to be an actual revenue, demonstrated revenue decline, I should say. It has to be 20% or greater, which is in keeping with best practices across the country where they offer similar programs. Does that answer? It does, so then like if I'm a business, then I might be calculating like, okay, qu the fourth quarter of 2024, holiday season, yeah. that might be the biggest impact that I'm gonna see over the next 12 uh -huh. months, yeah. and so it makes sense for me to apply in January it 2025. Would. It would, and we'll have more than one round, so there'll be a round that'll open but, up. But didn't you say you can only apply once? You can only, well, you can apply more than once. If you don't, you can only be granted, you can only get a grant once. <coughs> if we had more money, we would do it every year. Right now we can't. Um, but let's say you don't get a grant in round one because maybe you didn't meet the 20%, but then all of a sudden Q2 of 2024 or 25 comes around and you're going, oh, I'm gonna apply in round three because now it looks like I have hit that 20%. So there'll be three or four rounds, probably four rounds in 2025. If you don't make the first one, there could be an opportunity to apply in a later round. Um, there was something else. Oh, did you ask how long does it take to get the money? Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, we try to move that as quickly as possible. You know, we open around for four weeks. We have to wait till everyone applies. You know, so we have to wait till everybody's in the pool. Um, and then we go through a review. We do a financial review. So that takes, once the round closes, that usually takes two weeks. Then we decide who's getting a grant. We don't decide. I shouldn't just put it that way. I mean, it really is based on the greatest revenue decline that's demonstrated um, and the availability of funds. We put together an award list. Uh, Mile High United Way gives us an invoice 
immediately, same day, we send it over to our finance team to process. It goes to the city controller's office. They advance the money, because Mile High United Way doesn't have $300,000 just sitting around, so we have to advance the money to them. So it is unfortunately probably about a three week, three to four week process after each round closes. I know that seems interminable. I have had businesses show their landlord, look, I'm getting to be getting this grant. I might be late with the rent this month, but I'm getting this grant, so please grant me a little bit of time. <laughs> so yeah. so then I think then maybe just to ask the question for Chris or and or Danan yeah. is, that you, is like, what might be strategies to weather that gap or bridge that yeah. gap? Well, and in the tips and tools in the toolkit, there are suggestions such as, you know, maybe this is not a good time to go out and buy a whole bunch of new inventory. Maybe if you lose an employee to go back to college or school or something, you know, maybe it's not time to fill that position right away. So just think in terms of, yeah, you do want to forecast. You want to take a look at what your sales were, um, maybe modify your business plan a little bit. Is lost revenue the only factor or increased expense, operational expense as a result of the project? We address increased operational expenses. Um, there was a time when a business had to meet 30% or greater. Uh, we, tr we lowered that because we understood that as a result of re inflation, businesses were charging more because it would cost them more to produce their goods and services. So instead of having to meet 30%, we lowered it down to 20%. It and we understand revenue. Yeah. decrease. I won't be in that position, but we will certainly pick up cost because of expense, right? Yeah. All of my tickets are on sale already for the proposed period that will be impacted. Yeah. So unlikely to see any revenue change. I will certainly have to add labor um, into it. That could totally be 20% of my total labor cost. Would that be considered? No, we look at revenue decline which is the best practice across the country. No other uh, cities do that. It's demonstrated revenue decline. Okay, and we'll, we'll have more time <coughs> at the end too to ask more of these mm -hmm. questions. Hey, I, I, would, I would like to add something uh, just to kind of, when you're thinking strategically, if you have some kind of loss in revenue, the other thing to keep in mind is where your business is located with respect to where the construction is. So when you looked at the phasing, the first phase, it was on one side of the street. And so say you're on the north side of the street at Pennsylvania, for example. I know there's a church there, so that, but <laughs> anyway. Um, on that north side, there won't be any construction right in front of the business right there in phase one. But in phase two, it goes from the south side of the street and flips over to the north side of the street to do that sidewalk work. Or maybe if there's a tree going in there, it's going to be right there, very close to a business, potentially. So be mindful about that, too, because if you're located right where one of these stations are, first of all, congratulations. You're going to be really lucky in a couple of years. But... <laughs> it's going to be a little rough for a while when it goes to that phase when it's right by your business. Thanks, Joanne. Thanks, Joanne. I'm going to try one more time. A little, <laughs> different. little differently. Any three months while the project is on, and then a subsequent three months? Yeah, any, any different con revenue? Consecutive 90 days. Got me. Okay, and then just keep in mind, you know, maybe you say you've already pre-sold a lot of tickets. Oh, well, maybe I, yeah. by, I maybe by the time Q3 comes around in 2025, people are starting to say, well, I'm not going to buy a ticket to that concert because I've seen what it's like down there. I mean, yeah, I mean, I can show you October through December and then January through March. Or you could compare Q4 of 2024 with Q4 of 2023 right. before if, there was if, construction. There's in the... The three months after, yeah. if I have less revenue by too. 20%, we are eligible to apply. You could do that as well, yeah. So How work. long do we anticipate the phases to be, like, right, right, like, your side of the street closed down? It's a really dumb way to do it. It doesn't work. Um, say that again. Say that like, again. how long are these phases going to be? Um, like, that would impact a business on Colfax. Like, where your yeah. side of the street's shut down. You have no access. I... I'm not certain of that. Actually. Are we talking weeks? Are we talking months? Are we talking years? I, I, it, it probably depends on where you're at. Yeah. yeah. Because there, in 
certain sure. locations there's more work on one side of the street in certain locations all we're doing is maybe replacing some curb and gutter so uh, and as we get further into construction we'll have that information more detailed for you so we can come to you and say all right here in about a month we're going to come in and we're going to tear up your sidewalk and your curb and gutter and it's going to take two weeks we can't tell you that right now but you're going to come to us and tell yeah. us yes okay. yes and, yes. and, and yes. we will not do it the day before so <laughs> right. it will be much ahead of that it, right marcy it will be absolutely way ahead of that and just also wanted to note out that it won't be apples to apples in every phase mm -hmm. um yeah. because obviously some are longer and and some as, as we get into some of the larger sections too there's some of the stations can be built concurrently um, because the, the some of the streets are wider, and so those you know could have some efficiencies going along with it too when those stations are being built simultaneously. So again, we won't be out apples to apples, to apples, but we will start to really understand what does this construction look like. And again, another disclaimer: I want to get past um, kind of segment one. Um, we will have learned a lot, um, and there might be some lessons learned and some efficiencies. Uh, lessons learned for us, lessons learned for the businesses, um, so efficiencies in the way um, things are going with construction. I mean, you could get also get a really mild winter and things just, you know, kind of fluctuate. So, you know, even though you might be in segment four and we have a, a brief, t you know, band of, of how long that construction will be, you know, we might be able to realize some things in one and two that change how that, how segment four looks. And so it will be a bit of a moving target, but again, as we get closer, we will, we will have more certainty. Can, can we save it for the end just to keep running? Um, and I just want to mention, like, one of the plans for this event is the reason we want to do them every month is so that as we're developing this information, it may change or it may become a lot more, you know, thick, which is useful for you all, especially. Um, and the way we've kind of thought about it is that the first half is just as what you've experienced um, the experts on the project coming in and talking about what is, but then based on what what sort of feedback we've been getting from businesses transitioning into more programmatic. Um, so this, this chat, we've, we've um, focused in on the concept of business planning and forecasting and why that's so important, not just for grants, but um, what, uh, what Danan and Chris are gonna be talking about here. And then we'll transition and talk about attitudes. But what I do wanna just mention is that you have a lot of resources here, both in a lot of different, I mean, that, that word is so, so, means so many things, it's almost useless. But um, one thing I wanna draw attention to is that like not just business related, but marketing and communication based resources that hopefully this will show, um, I mean, and I'll leave my cards and things like that so that if, if you find yourself needing some of that more nuanced help, um, we can find someone or someone on the team can actually assist you with those specific needs. So um, if you need a minute for comfort, like if you need food or drink or a restroom break, please, uh, we're gonna transition and, and then uh, I'll give the floor to you two. Sounds great. You feel, you, okay, ready? Awesome, okay, well, briefly, I'm Danan Moore from Colfax Avenue Business Improvement District, joined with Chris Bishop. Um, I'll let him introduce himself before he speaks, but I'm also a Colfax Avenue business owner. So I sit in your shoes. Um, I recently closed a business, probably mostly due to economic hardship. Um, I think that the Denver Water Construction Project was really hard on my first business that we closed on Colfax. So I understand what it feels like to be impacted by construction. Um, and economic forces that you have no control over. So I sit here wearing two hats. Um, I've owned and operated businesses since 2007, which is why um, I thought it was appropriate to help Ryan out with talking about um, the importance of business planning. I think business planning gives um, an owner, an operator, the ability to kind of look under the hood, so to speak. So oftentimes us operators, owners, managers are busy um, in the mud, in the weeds, working with employees, that we don't ever really set much time aside to think about how we can improve our business. Um, have we gotten stuck in some old ways with our business? Um, are there things that the environment, our community, the economy might um, be applying to our business that we haven't really given a whole lot of time and attention to. So I do think that business planning is really important, not just for one, being a brand new business, but for being a business that's seasoned, you can get kind of 
blind to what your business is doing and how you can make improvements. So I'm just going to go over briefly why I think a business plan is important. Um, I think many people would agree, but um, it helps you in your business or helps your managers understand the vision and strategy to meet your goals. Why are you in operation and how do you get to the end result of making money? So this is a great way to um, kind of define what is that vision and strategy for your business. Every year, I'm sure we all hear from friends, families, uh, family members, coaches, loved ones, what are your goals? What's your resolution? This is an opportunity to design what is that resolution for your business for this next year. Um, I do think a business plan is really important, kind of piggybacking off of what Joanne said. Um, it helps you secure funding. If you're at a level with your business where you need to add a big piece of equipment or bring in more staff, it allows you to kind of design um, the framework of, you know, how are we going to be able to achieve that financial goal? Or how can we secure funding in the um, sense that we're going to have an economic impact? So this is just one kind of project you can work on to kind of get to that place. Um, it allows you to improve decision making. Um, if you don't have your goals, you don't really know what you need to achieve. So this allows you to improve all those decisions that you have to make and then trickle down to the team that helps you. How do you tell them to help you meet your goals if you don't really know what that goal is? So it broadens that communication. Um, a business plan also helps you track progress. Uh, tracking progress and performance is super helpful when uh, the economy is really going great. It gives you an opportunity to maybe think about uh, saving some money and putting it aside for big projects or paying yourself more or paying your employees more. Um, but it also helps you per track performance in events like this where we may need to know is it time to pull a lever to help the business survive through a tough time? Um, so definitely, um, I think that's the most important part of a business plan. And Chris is gonna talk about this in a moment with uh, kind of financial projections um, and kind of planning what your dollars and cents does for your business. Uh, and then kind of going back to enhancing communication, this allows every stakeholder within your business to kind of be on the same page. Does not mean that you have to have this beautiful communications plan, you need to be a communications expert to articulate these goals and desires to your team, but it allows you to have something concrete to talk about and to kind of create, um, uh, well, what am I trying to say? Accountability. So it gives your company some accountability and then also gives your employees that same accountability. There's a tool and a marker for progress or no progress. And then having a business plan allows you to adapt to market changes. This could definitely be one of those examples. Is there a way then that you can pivot? Have you thought about all those things? What, what are your thoughts and ideas on if you do have to um, make a change to your business. What's within the limits? What's your, within your comfort zone? What are you willing to have your team push to do to make a difference? Um, and then it identifies risks and opportunities. And so I think this is another important part of the business plan. So Ryan, if you turn it to the SWOT analysis. A SWOT analysis is something that probably sounds a whole lot more technical and difficult than what it is. but it's basically kind of this four boxes and you can look at what are your strengths what do you guys do well within your business what's unique about your business what are what's unique about your products write all of that out it's a great exercise to just kind of remind yourself why you're awesome and why you're doing this and why you have your business or you're helping a company lead their business what are the weaknesses what what do you think could be improved so in this Case, you know, do you have some weaknesses? I'm going to just use um, a retail merchant. Maybe they don't have e-commerce, so maybe that's their weakness. It's not really setting them um, up to succeed or at the level of some of their competition. So that could be a weakness that could be improved. 
what resources could you use to enhance your business performance? This kind of goes back to if you know where your finances are, you know where your goals are, is there a big piece of equipment? Is there an inventory item you wanna add? Is there a new staff member, manager, marketing person you wanna bring on board to help en enhance your business performance? Is there a new software that you wanna add to your um, company? And then opportunities, are there gaps in the market? Um, and I would say if we could all think back to opportunities during COVID, one thing that stuck out was let's deliver. Let's get it to everybody's house. If they can't come to my store or my restaurant, how can we all like make this work and get it to their house? So I know that doesn't apply to everybody in this room, but it's an idea um, and a good example of what we can do to kind of uh, offer something at another level that maybe our customers aren't used to having. And then what are your goals for this year? Write those down. All your goals are opportunities to bring more money into your company. And then threats. So obviously talking here at a BRT meeting, a threat would be construction. So let's really talk about if construction impedes, impedes your business in any way, what, how do you see that changing the demands of your customer? Um, and then are there new trends to consider? So again, bringing back that retail merchant, not having an e-commerce platform. Is this time to consider like e-commerce is trending. We do see that people are buying online. Maybe it's time to kind of incorporate that into your business. Um, and then is what's the immediate threat? And that's where you can really kind of pick apart and dissect if BRT seems like it's going to be an immediate threat to your business, in what ways? In the way that you know your customers maybe aren't willing to navigate Colfax to look for parking, but really kind of dissecting this and discovering the truths about your business will only allow you to kind of gain some strength and power when you put this plan together. So we all do better when we set goals and really consider like on a personal level, what really is going to make an impact to myself to grow this year, you can apply that same thought process to your business. So thank you. That's about all I have to say on SWOT analysis, but if anybody wants a handy dandy worksheet, please feel free to email me. I'm with the bid. You can get a hold of me through Ryan. And if you want someone to walk you through it too, like individually, we have people who can just sit and like, who've done this a hundred times that can like, okay, well, have you thought about this? And let's dig deeper into this sort of opportunity and, and, and like essentially create one of those trees so that you can actually get to, oh, here's the revenue starter. And so and we, we yeah. do have a one pager with those resources mm -hmm. on it. So after this, um, there's a one pager over here with a lot of those resources. Some of them are very, very affordable. Some of them are free. Some of them are right here in Denver. Um, that's hard to see, but you yeah, kind didn't of expect a green wall. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> um, but yeah, they're, they are on paper. These are all on paper, yeah. and of course they're online, so you can just click on them. Yes, I just printed them so that you have an easy access to it. But, awesome. Yeah, you can navigate to the website. And then, kind of going back to um, answering that question, what can we do within our businesses to bring more business in if we do feel like we've identified our threats? Um, improve operational efficiencies. A lot of times, us owners, operators are completely blind to inefficiencies. And it's really nice to take a moment to think about timing out how certain aspects of your business run, um, you know, getting in touch with your staff and kind of talking through efficiencies with their processes, uh, and just kind of looking at it from a holistic viewpoint. What, What's taking too much time and where is my business spending money that maybe I've kind of ignored for the last couple of years, but I can't ignore that today. I would say that most business is guilty of having inefficiencies. You just have to tackle it and you have to confront it. And that's really hard because it comes to probably managing people. Um, but put that into your business plan um, in times like this. Ryan says, you know, we're going to be able to offer some social media marketing assistance um, and workshopping. So this is a good time to boost some of those marketing efforts. 
rely on your neighbors, um, ask questions. We've discovered in our district here in Colfax between Grant and Josephine, there are some really creative social media gurus that are our neighbors. And I'm sure if you stop for a moment, have a cup of coffee with them, they may be willing to tell you some of their secrets. I also feel like there is this shared opportunity of like marketing for each other. And so I think now is probably a good time to kind of create a plan for that. One of our plans for one of these chats is to do business to business. Yes. Um, and so actually introduce people to each other, but also those strategies about the easiest and freest versions. And catchiest. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and then it would not be right to ever write a business plan without thinking about what you want in your future. So lastly, I think a business plan allows you to decide your succession or exit plan. I have gotten to um, exit a 10-year-old business quite successfully. Had I not made a plan for that, I'm not sure that it would have worked out quite as well as it did. Um, and by the time I needed to sell a business, I, I needed to sell it quickly because we had a medical situation in my immediate family that made this even more possible because I had a plan in place. So let's just be honest. We all don't want to be running and owning and operating our businesses forever. So take the opportunity to plan your business for passing it on to an employee, passing it on to a family member, or exiting and being able to sell to somebody that is just as passionate about what you're doing as you are. So I'm going to pass it to Chris to talk about all the fun stuff, financial forecasting, Money. and why. <laughs> Money. All right. So my name's Chris. I'm actually with uh, UMB Bank, just up here on Gilpin. Um, I work in small business. We're actually up on the second floor of that building. Um, our group actually, there's six of us, and we actually cover the entire footprint of UMB Bank, which if you don't know, it's actually based out of Kansas City. Um, and so it's great to be here in a regional bank, not a big bank, not that I speak against them, I came from one, but really being able to be in the trenches of these conversations um, because what I do on the daily in my role is work with businesses typically with revenues under a million, typically who don't need to borrow more than 350,000 is kind of our metric, which I imagine is a good chunk of the room here, right? Um, and so that's my wheelhouse, that's what I do. I do deposits, I do lending, credit cards, lines of credit. We were talking about that stuff earlier. And that's kind of my lens where I come at this conversation from, is from the banker side of things. But I'm not talking to you on behalf of UNB Bank. I don't have a name tag. Do with it as you will, I don't really care. Um, I'm here to talk about what you as a business owner need to really think about, plan about, when it comes to financial access as BRT is coming along the line. Uh, Joanne talked really great about grants, and I will tell you that's your number one goal. Grants are amazing. Grants are, by definition, free money. But how are you going to get a grant if you can't prove that before 90, after 90 dip, right? Yeah, you can pull it from TOAS and, and your other um, you know, POS systems, but maybe you're in an industry that doesn't use a POS in that way, right? So how are you using your cash flow to be able to prove that, whether you're applying for a grant, whether you're coming to a schmuck like me for a loan or a line of credit, that's what this is about. Cash flow projections are part of your business plan. Oh, awesome. Yay, we have this. Um, so, cash flow projections are, as the name implies, a way to forecast or look ahead about where your cash flow is going to be as a business, as, as an organization, as a practice or a firm. I mean, this is you thinking ahead. I will tell you, in my experience, maybe 50% of businesses I've worked with have cash flow projections, and of those 50%, 80% of them are new businesses and they don't really know anything else to do. They know they have to do a projection, so they do it. The vast majority of existing established businesses that I've ended up working with, I will say do not have cash flow projections. And that's not good, and I'll get into more as to why on that. But as you can see here, cash flow projections, it's an Excel sheet. If you're a nerd like me, you're gonna live here all day, if you hate Excel, find a family member. There's someone out there, I promise you. And what this is, if you're looking up here, this is a month-to-month -month analysis, starting with month one in column B, all the way through, and then the last column is a sum. And this is, at the top, your income, and at the bottom, your expenses. And this is you, as a business owner, or business adjacent, thinking ahead for the next 12 months. 
what is my income going to be? What are my expenses going to be? If you're seasonal and you know that you're going to be spending a lot more money in the summer months, then your, your cash flow projections are going to reflect that. You're going to have higher expenses in those months. Hopefully you also have higher revenues during that, those months. And if you've been in business, you've already experienced historic cash flow. That's a profit and loss statement, a P&L. If you've ever been in QuickBooks, you export a P&L. That's historic. And if you are an established business and you don't have projections, your P&L is the place to go because your P&L will inform you what you should be thinking of going forward. Um, so I'm going to go back to my notes because I haven't been reading any of this stuff and I know there's important stuff I wanted to talk about in here. Um, keep in mind that cash flow projections, they're just like keeping a budget in your personal life. If you've ever used personal budgeting software, um, I don't know if anyone's used like YNAB or um, Mint, which I think is gone now unfortunately. Um, those are personal budgeting apps and this is a business budget is essentially what you're putting together here. Um, they're entirely forward-looking, like I mentioned, and you build them based upon assumptions. So you're thinking ahead about your business. You have to make assumptions. You can't see the future. If so, you wouldn't be a business owner, right? You'd be behind a crystal ball. As doing projections means assuming the future, that means you have to understand what you're assuming. What are your assumptions about your ability to collect funds? When you perform a service, when you sell a product, how long does it take you to get that money? If you're in retail, it's real time, right? As soon as that product passes the register, you get your cash. If you're in an invoicing industry or a service industry, um, maybe you're an architect, that kind of example, then you're gonna maybe do a lot of the work, collect some of it up front, but then you know that you're not gonna collect the other 50% until the work's done, right? There's all kinds of different cash flow models, and everyone's going to be unique in that. But you need to understand for your business, how long does it take for me to collect my money? Because that's your income section up there at the top. And as you go through the next 12 months, as you build out what you think the next 12 months are going to be like, you got to keep that in mind. I know that I do, as an example, I know that I do all of my work in March. Or maybe you're, let's, let's say you're a tax accountant. I do all of my work by April 15th. Um, that's great. But I also know as a tax accountant, I've got a lot of extensions. I'm not gonna collect maybe some of my revenue until all the way into October when the tax deadline comes for extensions. So you plan that out based on your history. Well, how much am I gonna collect in April? How much is gonna continue to be collected through until October? What does my income look as a tax accountant or tax preparer between October and the beginning of the next year when I start taxes again, right? Um, and so these are the things that you need to look for. Um, you know, net 30, 60, 90 are common terms that we all hear um, when it comes to being able to project what that looks like. Um, payables, your expenses, those are hopefully a lot easier to project ahead um, because you have an idea of how much your product costs, how much your staff is going to cost, that kind of thing. Um, and when it comes to projections, you don't just use 12 months. A lot of businesses will choose to do a year and a year beyond the first year. So you will do 12 months of cash flow projections month by month. For year two and year three, you don't do it month by month, you just do the year sum. And this gives you an idea, okay, at the end of the first year, we've got the following column in, which is your sum. What's year two going to look like compared to that column? What's year three going to look like? And keeping this as a rolling project for your business is really key because you have a 12-month window that you're always thinking ahead. What are the next 12 months going to be? But that year two and year three really helps give you that long-term mindset for your long-term goals. Because when you're going back to what Denon was talking about with your business plan, you're planning for the future. And it's, the future isn't just the next 12 months. It can be five years, 20 years, retirement, right? And these cash flow projections should definitely look to match that. The key also is to reflect back on your cash flow projections and see how accurate they are as you're doing them. If you project that you're going to hit certain income or expense figures in the six months down the road and you find that you've got half the expenses and double the income, well, that's awesome. That's a good problem to have. But that's also a time to go back to your assumptions. What changed? How come you were able to collect more and expense less when you didn't expect that? Because while it's good to have that, you also want to understand the why. And that again goes back to the, the root of 
the cash flow projections. Now, how does this play into BRT? When you're thinking ahead about all these expense categories, when you're thinking ahead about all your income opportunities as a business, when it comes to those and they relate to BRT, you're gonna be using those mostly for your own information. You're also gonna be using those to send to Joanne for grants and to me for loans. Existing uh, businesses who've been in operation for a while, banks aren't really gonna look at your cash flow projections too much because banks, credit unions, we're cash flow lenders. We lend based on your history of cash flow. If you're less than two years in operation and you don't have a history of cash flow though, this is all we have to go on as a bank or a credit union. And that's when SBA lending would come into play is you would give up your cash flow projections and you would say, give me a loan, give me a line of credit. I know I don't have two years in operation, but this is where I'm gonna be. And then that bank or that credit union can loop in the SBA to get you taken care of, right? And grants are a key example of this. I don't, grants don't look at projections. You guys look at the historic, right? The one exception is when we have had a new business. Okay. And we do permit that new business to use their projections to compare with their actions. There you go. But they have to be projections that were created as part of a business plan, or if you sign a lease, you your landlord wants to see projections. If you buy inventory, sometimes they'll want to see projections. So that's the exception. Absolutely. And, and they're not just important for you, they're important for the grants, they're important for any lending that you guys might need. Um, and sometimes it's all you have to go on, right? And so that's really, um, for me, I always consider it like a litmus test for your own trust in your own enterprise. The stronger your business plan, the more accurate your cash flow projections, the better off you're gonna be when it comes to business success altogether, right? Um, so keep all of this in mind. Um, you know, I think, um, what was it? Oh, the last thing I was gonna mention is, in the cash flow conversation and BRT is coming, you're thinking about the grants as first, which I, again, you should. But if we talk about this timeline that Frank was starting to talk about, the whole idea that you're gonna see a dip in your, in your gross revenue, and you've gotta sit there, you've gotta live in that space for 90 days before you have that proof that you can put in for the revenue, for the grants. What are you gonna do in that window as a business owner? If your revenues are dropping, but you don't wanna cut staff because you love your staff, you can't really cut costs because your lease isn't gonna change, your utilities aren't gonna change, your cost of goods aren't gonna change. So what do you do? You're gonna live on your savings, right? If you have savings, you're gonna use that to cover that difference and make those continued expenses despite the dropped revenue. Or that's when you come into your bank, your financial institution and ask about a line of credit because if I were a business owner in this situation when my revenue dips and I start to realize I'm not gonna I'm gonna be here for a bit and I don't really want to use my savings or maybe I don't have savings that's when I start to use my line of credit to continue supporting that expense my line of credit goes for 90 days my gross revenues continue to drop now I can go and ask for a grant I can use that grant to pay back that line of credit in some or in part, depending on how you went, right? And this is all part of that cash flow conversation. There's different tools for different scenarios. And if you use a line of credit to be able to cover that dip until you get your grant to pay that back, that's the way that I would go about it. You could also consider credit cards. I don't usually recommend that unless you sign up for a new card with no interest for a period of time as they do. Um, but credit cards have abysmal interest rates, so don't do that if you, if you can avoid it. But that's where all of this really plays in together, is being able to project ahead, all right, BRT, I've, I just got the phone call, they're gonna be here in three months. My projections in three months are here, I need to make a change and put it to here. So I think that's really the key to think about um, as you prepare for those conversations. If there's, if there's, if you have follow-up questions, you need follow-up information, like you wanna go in depth with this, uh, fill out our little survey and just ask for that and we'll get in touch with you and, and make sure that those resources, resources yeah. get. Thanks, thanks to you both very much for that. I have the last bit and I prompt, mine is gonna be short and sweet. I'm a communication specialist and we have a lot of lessons that we've learned from construction communication. And even though this might be redundant, maybe you know this, it's always good we think to just have little reminders so that it can help you brainstorm the messaging that you're going to push out. And so my section is really just how do we talk about BRT and how do we make that 
importantly connect to our communities. So it's, it's really simple from what I have to say, it's that communicating construction to your partners and customers is vital as long as you keep coming to you sounding easy, coming to you sounding like it benefits your customer and making sure that it sounds positive and fun. Um, that might sound counterintuitive because you might be heavily um, impacted, but what, what we've seen over time is that when you start to share that information with your customers, they build subtly these associations with you as being difficult to get to, difficult to work with, not because you've done anything different or that your relationship with those individual customers is different at all, it just creates this sort of subconscious conversation. And we wanna try and avoid that. So when we keep things sounding easy, that means that one of the things you can do is create maps and uh, clear directions for getting to you. Um, but also, and I know this might, and I don't want this to sound like um, it's a fix-all or that I know that I know that sounding positive doesn't solve the, the issue, but having fun with it, sounding like you're having fun with it, can make a world of difference. So for example, providing details, like don't ignore that it's here, don't try to pretend that the construction isn't happening, you should definitely address it, but you know, never say something like, it's hard to get here. Or um, one of the ways that you can um, kind of make this more interesting for your customers is if you keep things sounding like it benefits them. So for example, offering stamp cards for free car washes, if you come in three times through the dust, uh, there's a benefit to you. Um, or construction specials, what we call hard hat specials for construction workers. We're gonna, we have a lot of um, case studies about how easy it is to turn construction workers into customers. Um, and so thinking through that because, you know, they're doing work here and if they hear you say something negative about it, then that might turn them off from wanting to patronize your business, but also special events that are geared around construction. So associations, right? We want to be consistent, above all, keep things sounding positive and fun. So when we talk about specific impacts, you may be implanting bad associations that never leave. And this especially is important when, you, when we talk about involving the media. Because when you involve the media, you create sometimes a wider concern. And even if people can empathize with you, it can backfire. And I'm going to give you an example. On 16th Street, which I just want to emphasize is very, very different than this construction project. Mm -hmm. The type of impacts, the type of communities, it will not be like that. Um, because again, this phasing program tries to take care of a lot of the issues that are happening there. But um, one thing that happened on the 6th Street Street uh, was, you may have seen it on the news, but um, one of the businesses unfortunately had um, a sewage break in the basement and filled with sewage. So they are cleaning it up, but they went to the media and it went out. And the thing is, is that my heart and every heart is going to go out to that business, but forever that business is going to be associated with raw sewage, right? It's not your fault and it just makes it a little bit worse. That's a case study learn, we, you know, we just know it's like it's, some things are just unfair, but there are different ways of, of dealing with it as well, okay? So luckily, um, that's not gonna happen on this project. Um, oh, okay, the other thing, so we stay positive by Focusing on the future, so creating talking points. Joanne mentioned this earlier. We have all kinds of key messages that we've created internal as a BRT team that you can absolutely use. All you need to do is ask. And what I mean by talking points is that consider turning individual things that we're talking about with this project and you, turning them into scripts and training your staff on how to use them. It's just like a political stump speech, right? You have this politician in Iowa who says one wrong thing one day, they go off script, and suddenly <laughs> that's the thing that you will be remembered for forever. So keeping those talking points consistent, that's why I say a script. You know, Print these messages and scripts out, keep them at the counter or by your phone, and regularly check in with staff to make sure they are figuring out how to say it in their own voice. Because it is difficult 
when you train people to sound like robots, and I get that, if they're just reading something on the phone to a customer who's calling in. So you're training, the way to train other staff members to say it is like, okay, ask them, how would you say this? Um, what kind of point, what kind of message really hits home for your customers? Take stock, learn which kind of talking points have carried the farthest. Um, so one of the things I mentioned, if they think it's too hard, that it doesn't benefit them, or that it's unfun, they will find excuses to stay away. And like I mentioned earlier, we can, we can help you with this. Um, but this last little part about thinking through your messaging is making optimistic push content. So if that's, that's a term, push just means like messaging that, or marketing that you're sending out to your customers. You're choosing what messaging to put out. This includes social media, newsletter, customer emails, flyers that you put up and distribute. Um, optimism is hard when you're suffering or if things just aren't fun in your own world. So my suggestion here is taking these talking points and figuring out how you make yourself, your business, a part of the good story of the BRT. So finding, finding ways to say the future of BRT is the future, is our future. And I've got a couple examples, the, the Thrive um, fact sheet up there also talks about this, but we're building a better tomorrow. Okay, I realize that these are very cliche statements and I, I needed to fit them on a PowerPoint slide. So this is how we're a part of Colfax's newest chapter. Okay, in your own voice, in your business's own. Um, and, 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 and again, if you need a brainstorming session or if you don't have a marketing department, very few people do, um, we have people on staff who can help you kind of think through what this push content looks like. Um, so with, with that, I'm going to transition into this last slide. Sorry, I had to flip from the PowerPoint to, uh, to my PDF because I missed a slide in the PowerPoint. Um, so next month, in addition to having the same update section in the first half, we are going to focus on social media solutions. Uh, we have, we're going to bring in a couple experts on Colfax who do this really well and they're gonna share some of their insights, how to monitor social media, how to create winning social media, but also how to partner with other people. Essentially what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a package that then you all can use, carte blanche. Whatever you'd like, there'll be boilerplates in there. That's just a term we use to say, like you can copy and paste the stuff that we use and put it onto your own thing, right? You don't have a, we realize a lot of people don't have a lot of time, so we're trying to save you a little bit of that time and energy by creating some of that um, ahead of time. So um, here are our two surveys. We've also printed them out. We'd love to hear what you thought about chats today, but then also what additional questions, what other types of information you'd like us to present in this programming section. Some of these, I know this seems a little formal. Some of them we would like to just make regular discussions where you can come in and have a safe space and just like complain and, 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 and talk about all the things that are annoying you and then we can find solutions for you or we can just um, buy snacks and uh, talk about it, um, triage. But whatever you need, like that's sort of what the role of small business outreach, my team, is here for is to, to listen but also to, to, to connect you to real real time solutions. So we'll have these once a month through October and then the holidays kick in and then we'll come back in January. So there's lots, uh, we're, we just wanna, we always want a place where we can come and meet and talk so that you can get updates as they arrive. Um, but in between, feel free to take any of our information uh, and we'll get you real time answers.